Hello and welcome to the NUS Law e-Open Day live engagement session. To kick things off and to give you one last chance to test your sound and audio settings, here's an opening address from our Dean, Professor Simon Chesterman. Hi, my name's Simon Chesterman and I'm Dean of the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. Welcome to our E Open House for 2020. I'm sorry I can't welcome you to our campus in person, our beautiful campus nestled next to the World Heritage Listed Botanic Gardens, but hopefully in these videos you'll have a chance to see a little bit about our campus, a little bit about us, and maybe to think whether you would be part of our future. Now we style ourselves at the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law as Asia's Global Law School. And really all those words combine to embrace three distinct identities that we have. First and foremost, we are the National Law School. We're the oldest law school. Our alumni include the current Chief Justice, Attorney General, Minister of Law, and, and so on and so forth. We produce the majority of Singapore's lawyers, and that's our first role. But we're also a global law school. We aspire to being one of the best law schools in the world, and we're among the top ranked institutions globally. What that means for our students is opportunities. Opportunities to go on exchange globally to more than 50 partner institutions in 20 countries and regions, uh, and also opportunities in terms of employment, both within Singapore and later on. Thirdly, we are also an Asian law school, and that also creates opportunities for our students that, dis that is distinct from opportunities they get if they go off to England to study, for example. Because what a graduate of NUS law has is an understanding, obviously, of Singapore, but also of the region, and that creates opportunities globally, regionally, and nationally. Maybe you want to be part of that. So how should you choose whether law is right for you? Well, let me start by giving you some bad reasons. Don't just study law because you've got the grades. There are plenty of opportunities for smart people in the world. Law may or may not be right for you. Don't do it just because you've got a fistful of A's. Don't do law just because you want to make money. There are easier ways to make money in the world than being a lawyer. Don't choose law just because you think you're going to be powerful and control the world. Uh, it doesn't always work out that way. So why might you think about studying law? Well, if you're like me when I was a student, what really interested me was understanding power, understanding how we regulate society, how we maintain the rule of law as opposed to the rule of the jungle. Um, secondly, if you're interested in words, if you love reading, writing, speaking, then maybe law is something that you can deploy those words to uh, make a career and make a difference. And that's linked with the third reason to study law, is that lawyers do make a difference. Law is a means of maintaining justice, maintaining order, uh, achieving equality. Uh, and so if these things interest you, if this is part of your passion, maybe law is for you. So maybe you've decided, yes, I want to study law, but should I study at NUS Law? Well, let me give you a couple of things to consider. Basically, that we offer opportunities globally and locally, and we offer a radically different educational model. In terms of opportunities, um, our alumni include not only the judiciary and the attorney general, but also partners in all the major law firms, not just in Singapore, but in places like Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, and New York. We also have graduates who go on to other careers, entrepreneurs like Tan Min Liang, who runs Razor, people who become diplomats like Tommy Ko, or playwrights like Ivan Heng and Eleanor Wong. So all of these are opportunities that we cultivate through an educational model that is very different from what you've experienced at junior college. Because when you come to university, and when you come to law school in particular, uh, the model of education in many ways is flipped on its head. In a lot of schooling, especially secondary school, the job of the teacher is to teach you answers that you are then tested on in an exam, whether you can find those answers in exam conditions. Law school, often, we don't really care what your answer is. What we're interested in is how you justify it, how you think, the critical analytical skills you bring to a problem. Because the reality is that for many students, certainly the good students in law school, just answering the questions isn't enough. I mean, I tell my own students, if you can answer my questions in class, fine, you're an okay student. If you can predict my questions, then you're a pretty good student. But the best students, the ones that I remember, are the ones who ask me questions I'd never even thought of. And that's really what education at university is about. We're seeking to have an opportunity to explore new issues, new careers, new research potential with our students. And that is why it's so important that we have high-ranking faculty who are experts in research. Because people who are experts in the research are very good at identifying novel questions and routinely work with students. That's true whether it's in our Center for Maritime Law, our new Center for Technology, Robotics, AI and the Law. The opportunities in banking and finance law are linked with 
the skills of the faculty, not just in giving you information, you can get information on the internet. It's about coming up with new questions together with you. And that's why it's such an exciting place for me to work, because even though every year we're running a similar academic program, that program's never really the same. First, because the law changes, circumstances change, we have to adapt. But secondly, most importantly, the great thing about NUS Law School is every year we have an influx of incredibly bright young men and women who help us see the law anew, see our research questions anew, and it reminds us why we started studying the law ourselves in the first place. So maybe that's of interest to you, maybe you want to be part of this, and maybe I'll see you on campus sometime very soon. Thanks very much. Welcome back. And thank you so much for making the time to join us this evening uh, when we hope to answer such existential questions like why study law? Why study law at NUS? And do lawyers really dress like those guys on suits? Um, my name is Eleanor Wong. I'm the Vice Dean for Student Life and uh, International Relations here. Uh, and I will be your host for this evening. To actually answer your questions are my fellow panelists, whom I'll introduce now. So first, zooming in from a secret location on this campus as part of our business continuity plan uh, is our dean himself, Professor Simon Chesterman. Um, brave enough to be with me um, in this room. Uh, on my left, uh, my uh, co-vice dean, I suppose, my fellow vice dean, Professor David Tan, who is in charge of everything academic, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, on my right uh, is Wee Min, who is the president of our law club. So she's in charge of the students, right? Um, I can already see that uh, all of you have found the Q&A icon on your screen, so there's a whole bunch of questions already starting to pop up, but if you're not sure how to do it, again, there should be an icon that says Q&A, and if you click on that, you should be able to submit your questions. If you like any question that's already there, please just vote it up. But before we get to your questions, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as the facilitator, and I'm going to ask the first question for the evening. I'm going to ask um, to all my fe fellow panelists, um, What's the one thing you would say to someone who's trying to decide whether or not to do law? And since uh, David is the most colorful one <laughs> among us, I will start by directing the question to him. Sure, thank you. I, I think you need to be curious because there are many qualities. You know, you've got to be analytical. Uh, you've got to be intellectual. I think to be curious is important because in... In law, you cannot be satisfied uh, with what people tell you, that you cannot be satisfied that there is one answer. You need to want to learn for yourself. You need to want to challenge the status quo. You, you therefore need to be curious. You, you need to verify what your professors tell you because they're not always right. You know, you got to go on Google, fact check. Uh, so I think <laughs> oh, <laughs> being, being, being curious at least got man. me through law mm. school. So mm. I, I would say being curious is important. Mm. Simon, do you agree? I think being curious is vital, but if you're still debating whether to study law, I'd say gather more information. And candidly, you can get some information from faculty like myself, David, and you, but really I would look to the students. I'd, I'd listen very carefully to what Wee Min says next. I'd look at the student videos on the website. Uh, and I'd talk with people who've studied law, including those who've gone on to become lawyers, as well as those who pursued different careers. Uh, and see whether the kind of critical analytical skills that we develop in law school are of interest to you. So, well, that's, that's the official line, but um, what's the real answer we mean from the student's <laughs> perspective? What were you thinking when, um, I, th did you have to decide between law and something else or was law your first and only love? Well, honestly, I've never really, or I didn't always know that um, I was going to do law until basically until I was here. Uh, in fact, I came from a science background. I did history, physics in JC, so some of my tutors were really shocked that you know, I ended up in law. Um, but one of the reasons why I chose law was really, uh, I found that I had an interest in, in argu arguing, maybe not so with people, but just <laughs> in arguments. Um, so how to construct arguments, how to deconstruct arguments, uh, and really understanding how one premise leads to another and how you get that conclusion. So the whole flow of that logic was something that I found very interesting. Um, something that I thought I could develop further here at NUS Law. Well, um, 
I have now uh, got um, two questions that are trending right at the top of the list. <laughs> and um, I think I'm going to pass the hot seat to David for the moment. So the first question that's trending right at the very top of the list with 11 votes is, wow. what are the differences <laughs> between the curriculum in NUS and SMU law? We're heading straight <laughs> okay. into, into that. Right. And the second question is, um, which double degree program in law is most trending? So, David? All right, I'll do the first one, and, and maybe the Dean Simon can jump <laughs> in as well. Uh, with NUS and SMU, you know, if you were curious enough and gone online to look, you'll find that uh, we are ranked quite differently in, in terms of our global rankings. In terms of curriculum, because the requirement to practice requires us to teach the same basic core, uh, we're quite similar. We teach tort contracts, property, uh, company law. But what really distinguishes us is uh, we bring in many visiting professors, uh, at least 24 each year from Oxford, Harvard, Yale, UCLA, Melbourne, uh, to teach intensive courses to our students. And we bring the best professors from around the world to come in. And also we offer um, many more electives, I suppose, compared to SMU. We have 120 electives a year for you to choose from. You can do things like international space law, uh, law and literature, uh, Chinese intellectual property law. Uh, these are, are subjects that I think NUS offers to our undergraduates that I don't think uh, SMU currently uh, is able to offer. Simon, you look like you, you had something to say. I mean, I, I would agree with David that that breadth uh, is important. I mean, let, first, let me say one thing. SMU is a very good law school. Its dean is one of our alumni. Uh, he's a great guy, very strong faculty there. Um, but the, really, the advantage that NUS offers is breadth and depth. Breadth in terms of the range of subjects you can study, not only within law school at the 120 or so electives, but also across the rest of the university, including those double degree programs we'll get to in a second. But also depth, that we, uh, because we are this high-ranked faculty, it's not just about, um, uh, about the way in which uh, you appear in a, in a league table. What it means is we have faculty who are experts in their area, and that gives students an opportunity to really dive deep into subjects in a way that you can't always if you're just approaching law as a professional qualification. And I suppose to me that's the most important thing for students to keep in mind as they think about their university choice. Don't just think about going to law school to become a lawyer. Uh, because the reality is people will have many careers, most of them lawyers, but many of them going in different directions. Uh, and so that breadth of education, that depth of opportunity uh, really lays a solid foundation for wherever you end up. Mm. I, I also want to jump in to say that in terms of the, the teaching, mm. uh, we, we teach in the seminar style that SMU has. We also teach in a lecture tutorial style, which I don't think SMU has. Mm. So lecture tutorial means as a whole cohort, let's say 250 of you in first year, uh, you attend lectures together. And then you break up into tutorial groups of about 12 students in quite an intimate class setting uh, for two hours. And you can discuss the, the topics um, in a more in-depth fashion. Mm. Uh, I think we offer both seminar and tutorials, but SMU only has seminar. So that's another uh, key difference between the teaching. Right. So in terms of choice, et cetera, let's get to that double degree mm, uh, mm. question. And um, yeah. yeah. So double degree, uh, as you would have found out if, if you looked around, and, and also uh, this is the brochure <laughs> you should download and, and look at. The double degree is a five-year degree program, and we have a number of them, as you would know. I think economics is probably the most flexible uh, in the sense that if you want to work in the business world, you don't know whether you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to join a bank, a multinational corporation, or be a corporate lawyer. Law economics gives you the widest choice. Uh, and I think it's possibly the most popular double degree program. But what I want to urge you to look at is our minor. We talk about minors here. You don't need to spend five years. In four years, you can carve out a um, number of subjects to study economics, communications, and new media, business analytics. So this expands the universe even broader than the double degree program. There's a related question, which is I read that NUS law does not allow ad hoc 
DDPs. I guess we have we, have, yeah, we offer yeah. structured DDPs, yes. but we don't offer ad hoc DDPs. And the question yeah. is, um, sort of, why is that yeah, so? Yeah. So, so currently, we don't offer ad hoc DDPs. I think very, very few top universities do that. Is because we look for synergies between, you know, a, a particular discipline and law. Uh, so if you look at say, if you studied economics anywhere, it is a three-year degree program. A uh, law is four, so three plus four is seven years. And when we do a structured DDP, we, we look to see where you can count economics topics or mm -hmm. subjects as law and law as economics. So we condense it into five because there's synergy. So if you did say law and literature or law and French you know, <laughs> in, in the <laughs> faculty of arts and social sciences, that's just not enough synergy. So, so we, we can't structure DDPs like that. Okay. But you can still do these as minors. Right. So I think that's the flexibility of our program. Yeah. And, and for the person who asked how they should opt for the double degree program, um, the, the, the same application form mm. allows you to do so. If you have any trouble at all with that, um, just write into our uh, law undergraduate UG ADM admissions uh, email, and um, mm. they'll help you with the more uh, technical or administrative uh, uh, questions. Um, so we've been talking a bit about uh, the double degree program, but um, another kind of fairly high ranking question that I'm going to pose to women is, is there a lot of memory work required <laughs> being a law student? And I'm going to look for a few others that um, are in the, same, um, in, the, in the same field. How are the working hours like for a fresh law graduate? I am concerned about <laughs> work-life balance. Um, what else? Um, uh, OK, those were the first two. Oh, there was one more about. Um, uh, the reputation of sort of law, uh, law students and Singapore students, I suppose, as being all about memory work and textbook um, mm. uh, learners rather than, I suppose, real problem solvers, etc. So I'm going to throw all of those <laughs> things to you because you are the hope for the future generation. I'm pretty much a you know washed up has been, so you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is this stereotype that law is really a lot about memorizing cases. In fact, today I was on, on the way here, I took a cab ride, and I was talking to the driver, he was asking me, you know, do, do you spend all your time just memorizing cases? And the answer really is no. Um, in fact, nowadays, most of you know, our assessments are either open book or even sometimes open computer. Um, so I think memory work is a very, very small part of learning here at NUS Law. I think a bigger part really is understanding what the cases stand for. Uh, and really just learning and developing those critical thinking skills. Uh, in fact, a year one subject that I, point, I could point to uh, draw your attention to really is um, Legal Analysis, Research and Communication, it stands for LARC. So you, if I you come... That. Yes, <laughs> so uh, from Elders <laughs> teach that as well. Uh, so if you do come to law school, it's actually one of the subjects you will do in your first year. Uh, and really what you do is you learn how to write, um, you learn how to speak, and you really just learn how to form arguments and communicate effectively. So I think that was really important, and it was a very interesting subject for me to take. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. See, I've trained her so well that um, she knows all the right things to say on an interview. Um, and, and, and later, we'll be giving uh, those of you who want the actual behind-the-scenes um, story from the students, we'll be giving you an, an, an email or a, a, a contact that you can get straight to the students and get the story from them. But um, so, um, you know, not so much um, memory work. In, in fact, uh, open book exams mean that you really um, uh, have to absorb and, and, and know what you're doing. And then if you get through all those trials and tribulations, there's a question here about what happens after I graduate? What, what are the career paths like for someone with a degree um, from uh, NUS law and indeed from law generally? And I'm going to uh, pass that over to Simon, who has been sitting patiently in his little secret hideaway. <laughs> One of the misconceptions that many people have coming into law school is that it's about just becoming a lawyer. And obviously, we are the national law school. We produce a, a, either a plurality or majority of Singapore's lawyers. The vast majority of our graduates go do, uh, sorry, do go on to practice law, uh, but many of them go on to other things as well. So we have people who, um, like David was saying, do uh, economics or a commerce degree. They use that to become entrepreneurs. We have people who go into business, like Tan Bin Liang, I mentioned in the video, the head of Razor. Um, a disproportionate number go into politics. We have um, 
I think about a dozen members of parliament who are our graduates on, uh, in more than one political party. Uh, and so uh, the skills that a law degree offers you, the skills that we try and hone at NUS Law, really are more than just, certainly to women's point, uh, it's more than just memorizing what the law is, it's how to be articulate, how to critically analyze a question, how to come up with a question, uh, and that's useful in all sorts of careers. Uh, so I think our, the answer to the question, where do our graduates go? They go everywhere. And indeed, there is a question uh, about whether um, our graduates go anywhere um, outside of Singapore. I think the question was placed um, rather um, assertively uh, as, you know, what, what use is, is uh, uh, an NUS law degree out, outside? Is it any use? And I, I should start by saying that actually, um, uh, I suddenly found that my very old NUS law degree uh, obtained sometime circa 1985 was not bad in helping to launch my own career, uh, part of which I spent um, in New York uh, and then um, working in regional finance um, in Asia. So uh, certainly in those days, uh, um, uh, the NUS law degree was worth something, but um, how about today? Um, Simon, you want to follow on on the we're accepted and loved everywhere sort of a point? Sure. One, of the, one of the most exciting things that I do is meet our alumni on a regular basis, and I do that around the world. Uh, so obviously we have big alumni events in uh, Singapore. We've also got large alumni contingents in Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, London, New York, uh, Delhi. We've done uh, events in all of these locations. Uh, we've got good concentrations in Australia. Um, so our, our graduates really do go everywhere. Uh, and um, so that's partly cultivated through the exchange opportunities we run while on campus. So that means that around half of our students get to spend a semester or two abroad in um, partner schools around the world, uh, but also through an exchange plus series of agreements, uh, they can in four years just complete their, their full LLB and a Master of Laws at places like NYU uh, or uh, Toronto or King's College London. So we try and cultivate those opportunities while at law school uh, and also for those who don't go off on exchange, don't do the exchange plus, we bring the world to you. We have a really exciting visitors program that uh, Academic Affairs under David um, organized. So we bring the best faculty from around the world here uh, and exchange students from around the world come here. So that uh, it really means that it's a, a multicultural, a really diverse environment that prepares our students for a truly globalized world and a globalized career. And on that exchange plus, uh, I understand women that you <laughs> will indeed uh, be uh, doing one of our Exchange Plus uh, programs. Do you want to tell um, the audience a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So actually in year four, uh, I will be flying off to New York uh, to do the Exchange Plus program with NYU, so New York University. So honestly, what I think is really valuable about the NUS experience really is this global opportunity. Uh, not only do you get to learn from the best in Singapore, but you also get to learn from the best in the world. And that just means, not, not, that not just means um, these global professors coming here to NUS, but also you going out to meet them. Uh, and so as part of this uh, Exchange Plus program, I actually get a bachelor's degree and as well as a master's degree from NYU in just four years. Mm -hmm. So to me, I mean, if you're like any other Singaporean, you love value for money, value for time, <laughs> this, is really, this is really what you're looking for. Yes. I, 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 I just want to make a plug mm. for uh, the Law Chat series with me. And uh, Chen Zhi Ta, mm. who, who okay. went to uh, NYU. So we have a series of five videos, uh, short interviews with students and alumni. So Chen Zhi Ta is one of them, and he did the Exchange mm. Plus at N NYU. He mm. came from Tamasic Poly, mm. and he's now uh, a partner practicing maritime law. So it's, it's very interesting. Uh, perhaps you should look at that. And there's another uh, law chat series with Paveen Kaur with the Foreign Service. So uh, the question's about, you know, where can the degree take you? She's a Foreign Service officer and ultimately she's going to be a diplomat. Uh, we have two alumni. One is a High Commissioner to the UK, Fu Chi Xia. Another one, Kok Li Ping, is the permanent representative to ASEAN based in Indonesia. So if you don't want to be a lawyer, and we have many lawyers based around the world, uh, the Foreign Service, you know, is, that's where your law degree also takes you overseas. Yes, I can definitely recommend those uh, law chat videos, not only because David is in all of them, <laughs> but because you can get a, get a full range of sort of the different pathways that some of our uh, uh, graduates have taken, including, I understand, 
on tour with Kit Chan. Yeah, was yeah. that something you had anything to do with, David? <laughs> yeah, By the well, way, David okay, is, okay, uh, okay. you know, so, um, uh, 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 sort so, of a so renowned photographer. So when we're talking about and, yeah. the, the diversity mm. of electives, the breadth, I, I teach entertainment law, and, and Kit Chan's a dear friend of mine. So one of my students, uh, Min, Tong Min, she's also in one of the videos, uh, she's a very unusual career path. She was in the USP, University Scholars Program. So she had some breadth subjects in addition to law. Mm. And then she was president of the jazz club. So all those skills she learned in law school, she used them mm. on the tour with Kit Chan. Mm. So she went with Kit Chan, the Spellbound tour, and then she managed the entire band. And then what does she do now? She's a real estate lawyer at Lee and Lee, working on on-block transactions. So, so this is really leading a very full life while at university and sort of being able to combine your artistic interests uh, with your legal interests and doing pretty well you know, after mm. graduation. Yeah. Um, we, we've got a whole bunch of questions that are actually about sort of, you know, getting admitted to mm -hmm. NUS law and all. So we'll, we'll move there, but maybe just be, before we do that, let's um, uh, answer the other sort of big um, existential question. Um, will technology mm -hmm. replace lawyers? Look into your you know, um, crystal ball and um, I'm sure Simon has a view on this. It's no, no doubt that technology is transforming many, many parts of the economy. Uh, in terms of law, we think it's helpful to distinguish between two ways in which technology is affecting the law. One is the kind of law of technology, how we regulate things like autonomous vehicles, um, autonomous weapons, things like that. Uh, but I suspect the question really gets to the, the, the matter of how technology will change the practice of law. Will lawyers themselves be replaced by technology? Now, I'm old enough that um, when I was a summer clerk in a law firm back in Australia in the 90s, um, I remember seeing two lawyers being paid a couple of hundred dollars an hour each as one read from one document while the other read out loud from one document while the other followed along on his copy of the document to check that the two were exact copies. Uh, now, today, that would take seconds with document scanning. Uh, I don't think either of those lawyers today would regret that they don't have to sit there reading out loud a document. And to me, that's what the impact of technology on law will be. It will make us more efficient. Uh, I don't think it will take away the need for humans to resolve disputes. Uh, we will still need lawyers. We will still need those critical analytical skills. The reality is we might need slightly fewer of the very junior lawyers, mm. but that will be replaced by other careers like legal analytics. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why we're trying to stay at the forefront of this at NUS Law. So uh, just late last year, we launched a new Center for Technology, Robotics, AI and the Law. Uh, we're expanding the range of electives. We're hiring in this area. So we really want our students not to be the people who are replaced by lawyers. We want our students and our graduates to be the people giving the, the computers the instructions. And on a sort of co-curricular basis, I know that our students are um, very active um, in seeing how law and tech can fit together. And uh, women, I think there's a sub-club, right? Yeah. Under um, the law club that, that does, does quite a bit of tech stuff. Correct. So we actually have an interest group. Uh, it's called Odd Law. Uh, and what they do is that they run legal tech related activities and events. Uh, in fact, earlier this year, we had a legal tech competition together with Wong Partnership. And so students come in, they partner with students from other faculties. Uh, they come up with some sort of legal tech um, creation and then this is judged by the Wong P lawyers. Mm -hmm. So really here, we are very much aware that technology can affect us, will affect us, uh, and we're also looking into how you know, we, can make, we can make use of technology to make our lives easier in the future. And one of the great things about that, that hackathon, uh, uh, which I was also involved in, was that um, the idea was to come up with an app that would benefit um, some of our pro bono beneficiaries. So uh, it was not just um, law, not just tech, but also for a good cause. And uh, I think that's what our students are very much engaged in uh, as well. And of course, on the curriculum, um, David, you want to say a little bit about uh, technology in our curriculum? Yeah, yeah. we organize our subjects into so sort of specialist clusters. So even if you don't uh, graduate let's say law and majoring in something, you can choose from a uh, basket. So we have the IP and technology law cluster and we have a number of electives, quite a wide range of uh, information technology. So IT law one, IT law two, uh, we have copyright in the internet age. Uh, we're gonna be offering legal data science, which is an analytics 
tight course. And we often bring in visitors from around the world. Uh, someone from Chicago is coming to teach a course in that field as well. So we're constantly evolving. Uh, we hope to offer one in cryptocurrencies mm. in the near future. Mm. Mm. Simon, did you have something you wanted to say? If not, I'm going to ask you the next question. All right. So uh, when we, as I said, we have uh, quite a few questions that sort of about um, the whole process for applying, um, how, how many uh, uh, applications do we get a year, um, how, how many do we shortlist, and how many uh, end up finally in, in law, and what's the process uh, all of that takes. And I thought maybe, um, Simon, you could uh, kind of give that big picture on that. The end result is our intake is about 240. Um, but for every one of those 240 or so students, we interview maybe four times that number. Uh, and that's after shortlisting from six, seven, eight, nine, sometimes 10 times that number who applies. So it's, it's hard to get into law school. We totally acknowledge that. But the process of shortlisting is done in two basic ways. The first is, yes, there is an academic cutoff. Uh, and I think there are some questions on that, but the detailed answers we can maybe push to a little bit later. It's hard to get the cutoff, um, but um, that's, that's one basket of people is the pure academic cutoff. But secondly, we do allow for discretionary admissions. Uh, and that's really an attempt to uh, acknowledge the fact that it is hard to be a lawyer. You need to be bright to be a lawyer. You don't necessarily need to be a rocket scientist, however. Uh, and so what we're looking for in discretionary admissions is evidence of excellence in other areas evidence of leadership, evidence of, um, uh, of something in the spirit that, that uh, might be relevant to the practice of law. Um, but it could be anything from competing in the Olympics to playing a leadership role locally uh, to, to various other things. There's, there's details on the admissions website. The reason we do that is that we do realize that more than just academics go into being a lawyer, that you need other skills. That's also linked with what we do with these two baskets of people, which is we then give them a written test and an interview. And the written test is basically a chance to see whether you can process information, communicate in writing. Uh, and the interview is to see whether, candidly, you're the kind of person we want to have in the classroom. So the sort of things we're looking for in an interview is, uh, does someone, can they form an opinion? Can they defend that opinion? Uh, and then the end results, after all of this process where every faculty member spends at least two full days interviewing, plus countless hours reviewing the essays, uh, is we end up with 240 people, a little bit like we men, uh, who we're enormously proud to have in the classroom and who we've really got a stake in the success of because we've spent so much time selecting them. We really want to make the most of the time while they're in the law school and then take pride in the achievements they go on to afterwards as our alumni. What was your interview like? Mm, for me, I was um, in the, uh, my interview was about maybe, I think, 15 minutes. It did feel like it was quite long, <laughs> but I think realistically, it was probably at max 15 minutes. Um, but I was quite relaxed. I didn't really, wasn't really too intense or anything. Uh, really was just about getting to know you better as a person. So of course, standard questions like, why do you want to do law, things like that. Of course, I think by that point in time, you should more or less have an idea. Um, but yeah, so other than that, it's really more or less about getting to know you better, um, your ideas, your opinion, how you think, and really like what uh, Dean said, how you form an opinion and whether you can defend it. So do you remember what was what was the opinion that uh, you, were, you were asked to express and um, how rigorous was the testing of that opinion? Okay, so maybe, maybe I'll just share a bit about my interview questions or my interview experience. Uh, for me, uh, it was quite open-ended, so I sort of moved the interview towards a um, more about sort of the area of law that we were interested in. Um, and I said something about, I think, intellectual property and um, you see the whole idea behind um, how... <laughs> Did you know what intellectual property was? <laughs> I knew very, very little. I'll, I'll be honest, oh, I knew brave, very little. Brave, brave. <laughs> um, yeah. we, we did speak a bit about, um, I think there was, there was this issue about this monkey who took a selfie and then whether or not the monkey, the monkey owned the, have, yes. the photo. Yeah. I actually uh, teach that case. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, yeah we, we spoke a bit about that. Then yeah. I think there was another case about um, this uh, photographer who screenshotted people's Instagram mm -hmm. profiles and uh -huh. then 
he sort of published them and uh, mm. put them up in a gallery yeah. and he sold them for I think thirty thousand or, or a bunch of yeah. a lot of money basically. So yeah. so we discussed a bit about sort of ownership and, and things like that in, in terms of intellectual property. By the way, if you're used to ten year questions, you should know that uh, questions <laughs> seldom repeat no, themselves yeah. and uh, <laughs> you know it's no point going up and uh, going out there and just yeah. studying out on uh, monkeys who take selfies because um, what you know your your interview will probably be about something totally different, right, David? Can I yeah, just, sure. yeah uh, I, I've interviewed uh, many times, and, and I thought we, we kind of adapt to the person in front of us. So the way we interview is two professors and, and one student, so you have our full attention for 15 minutes. And it can be what is trending and topical, uh, or what you do in school for your CCA. So for instance, I was interviewing someone from RI who plays rugby. They said, you play rugby, right? They said, yeah. <laughs> then I said, okay, so do you consent to injury in when you play <laughs> rugby? Then he's like, to some injury, then, you know, so, so the kind of analysis about liability, uh, negligence, will, will evolve around what you do in school. You know, if you play music, and then they say, okay, um, when you play music in an orchestra, you know, then we develop uh, hypothetical sort of scenarios from there. So it's not something you can prepare, and, and everyone could possibly get different questions, but they all require some analysis. Yeah, that's like the time I went to give one of these talks, right, to, 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 to prospective students, and I started talking about whether Spider-Man, right, Peter Parker, had a, had a, had a, had a greater um, sort of responsibility for his Uncle Ben's death because he had superpowers and he didn't stop the guy. Anyway, you can tell that we lawyer-like people, we think about the strangest, craziest things, um, and if indeed... Uh, you were sort of watching the latest summer blockbuster and it suddenly occurred to you, oh, you know, um, should um, Thor be liable for X, Y, Z, whatever it is, then maybe you're the sort of person who would find law school very, very interesting um, indeed. Uh, I had a question here, um, whether candidates who come from polytechnics stand an equal chance in the admissions process, and the answer is absolutely, absolutely yes. Um, we welcome uh, uh, friends from polytechnics to apply. Uh, we're always looking out for um, a, a diverse uh, population to come into uh, law school. Um, so please don't let those sorts of considerations stand in your way. Just give it a shot, apply, um, get shortlisted for the interview, talk about selfies and, and then join us, right? Just to, to emphasize that once you are shortlisted, we don't know, and in many ways, we don't really care which school you're coming from. Uh, so from that point on, where you went to school, most of your CV is blind, certainly to the interview panel. So it does not at all affect um, your chances of getting in, which school you went to or didn't go to. Right. And conversely, there is a question about whether would I stand a higher chance of being shortlisted or selected if I have done internships in some prestigious law firms? Uh, and um, I, I, well, I'm going to stick my, stick my neck yeah. out here and then the others will no doubt disagree yeah. with me because disagreeing is also par for the course in, in, in the law faculty. I'm going to stick my neck out and say these days pretty much everyone knows how to pad their CV and go to, you know, eight different law firms uh, for internships and say how much they, they enjoyed law and, um, you know, watched some um, eminent lawyer, um, you know, argue in court and it was the most inspiring moment of their life. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, pretty much every application that I read says something like that. Um, if it's true, it's great. But um, don't go do that just to um, sort of improve your chances of getting into law school. You're more likely to end up in the interview being asked exactly what that eminent lawyer did and why it was so inspiring and interesting. And if you weren't genu genuinely inspired or interested by it, you're likely to find yourself flailing uh, when that question comes. So uh, th th that's my view on it. But yeah, of course, yeah. others might have... Uh, Perhaps a more I oh, <laughs> I agree. David I agrees with me. Agree. For once, we usually have such diametrically no, 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 opposing I agree, I agree. Uh, uh, views on this. Wait a minute, you were kind of you 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 so, had a thought on this. Yeah, I'm guilty of uh, going to a, <laughs> doing an internship before coming to law school. But I will admit now, with hindsight, honestly, I don't think I benefited a lot from it. 
I think the most I got out of the internship really was the opportunity to sort of sit down and speak with a lawyer for a couple of weeks, um, figure out sort of where you can go with a law degree and, and speak to them firsthand mm -hmm. about what it's like studying law. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the most valuable experience. Um, I think in terms of whether it helps you understand the law better or anything, the truth is when you go for an internship like fresh out of school, you know nothing about the law, you probably can't really do much that's useful, if I'm being honest. Mm. So I don't think I really learned a lot in terms of the mm. law, but maybe mm. if you're sort of interested to speak with sort of a legal professional, then, then maybe that's something you might want to consider. And on that point, I think um, there was a different question coming from it, uh, the, roughly the same question but from a different angle. I'm considering between studying history uh, and studying law, and I really don't know if I'm suited to law, and this person asks, would you advise me to, to do an internship or to talk to seniors? And I think if that's why you, you want to do an internship, then by all means, um, maybe just do one internship in a law firm and get to see what being a lawyer is about. Because uh, I think a lot of people um, have an idea that studying law is sort of studying about um, law as a system or viewing it sociologically, and they might not have the... Um, idea what it means to actually do law and going to a law firm doing an internship is certainly one way of finding out um, what it's really like on the ground and of course do talk to, to seniors yeah. um, a lot of you have uh, uh, access to that um, Simon other advice to someone choosing between history and law yeah I think to, to, to we men's point I mean one of the things that you could learn while shadowing a lawyer or spending some time in a law firm is that you don't want to do law and that's fine. Some of my best friends are not lawyers. Um, but um, on the kind of preparations you can do for law, um, so women I think is in, uh, there are a good number of students, myself included, I did double maths and physics before going on to law uh, along with some humanities subjects. Mm -hmm. And I think law really does attract two types of people who over, over, overlap somewhat. One is logical thinking uh, and obviously that's important in law in terms of the reasoning and so on. But also the, the overlap with history is the love of language, love of ideas, the, the way in which um, words shape culture, shape power. Um, that's, a, that's a different angle to come from, but I think they're really complementary when they work out in law school. You need both. You need that analytical frame of mind and you need the ability to work with ideas. Um, but uh, for the history student or the history buff, one possibility is to do both. As David was saying earlier, you can do a law degree, a lot of law is history, uh, and then you could pursue an interest in history through either a double degree or perhaps through a, a minor uh, where you take some subjects in history, enabling you to combine your passions. Hmm. Slightly different question, but also from someone not quite sure whether law is the right uh, thing for them. I am an introvert. I believe I write well, but I'm nervous about standing in front to present to people. Would you advise that I consider law? Or, um, you know, if you uh, really don't ever want to talk, uh, is it best to um, not do law, David? I, I think the, I'll probably say, okay, I would say don't do law because first year can be traumatizing. Uh, we, we do have that luck, <laughs> right? So, so I think, um, well, you can always switch out of law because you can't avoid, even if you're introvert, you don't want to stand up in court and perform before the judge, but you still need to at least talk to two or three persons, your clients, you know, and be confident enough to advise your clients. So if, if you're quite afraid of talking to, groups of people are uh, even presenting in a boardroom, it, it might be very challenging for you to do law, mm -hmm. uh, much less being a litigator. You don't have to be a litigator, but to be a corporate lawyer, you still need some confidence to be able to speak to people. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm going to disagree with you slightly. Um, I, I do think that um, if you never ever want to stand up and you're not prepared uh, to try, um, uh, and if, you know, uh, standing up and, and talking um, just gets you so stressed out that uh, it becomes unhelpful for you, then yes, I think law may not be uh, the right uh, place for you to, um, it may not be the right career, it may not be the right um, area of study. But having said that, um, I've, um, over the course of the years, taught many, many students who started out um, describing themselves in exactly this way as introverts, as people who prefer to communicate 
uh, through writing rather than through speaking, uh, but who put in the work and um, were willing to um, build up, I suppose, the thick skin to stand up there and to also present their ideas uh, orally. And many of them have gone on uh, to be some of the best mooters that I've yes, had the I honor of. I was thinking of, of someone who did that. Exactly, yeah. right, um, to, uh, yeah. of working with. Yeah. Uh, but you have, I, I guess you have to want to be prepared. Mm. And I'm kind of sensing that women is agreeing with me here too. Is that right? Yeah, would, yeah. You, would you have described yourself as an mm. introvert who preferred to write? I, I don't <laughs> see that as you. No, I don't, I don't think I would have considered myself an introvert. But I would say that I do have many friends in law school who do consider themselves introverts. Mm -hmm. They are quite quiet, um, I mean, in their daily lives. Uh, but I do think that in law school and just in university in general, something you might want to consider is, you know, who do you want to be 10 years later, 5 mm -hmm. years later? And also whether or not this course is something that, you know, could help you get there. So maybe you're an introvert now, but if, you know, public speaking or, or just being more confident and comfortable speaking in front of people is something you want to do, um, then perhaps law school could actually help you get there. So um, it's not so much about who you are now, but maybe who you want to be in the future. Just add in also, I think in, in, we're, we're talking in broad categories, introversion and extroversion are on a spectrum, so there's a, there's a whole range. Uh, but I've actually got some data. We did, um, so Ellen and David will remember, a uh, mm -hmm. Myers-Briggs personality type indicator test of the entire faculty of law. Majority of the academics came out as introverted. A big part of their job is standing up in front of a bunch of strangers and talking to them. Uh, so there are ways in which you can, can get over uh, your predilection. Uh, and, um, and make it part of your career. The one, one piece of advice I would give is uh, ignore it when people tell you to imagine your audience naked. Uh, that is the worst <laughs> advice in public speaking, especially if you are before a judge. Take it from me. Um, what is the lecture to tutorial ratio, David? Uh, and I, I know that is a total, lecture, you know, awkward uh, segue oh, said, with no okay, okay, linkage so, whatsoever. Mm. I don't completely understand the question, but I, I will attempt to answer that. Uh, so I, I would say our f fourth year, third year and fourth year subjects are all seminars. Our first year subjects, we have uh, four subjects taught in the lecture tutorial style and two subjects taught in the seminar style. So that's first year. Mm -hmm. uh, second year, we have, I think, three subjects, three or four subjects taught in the seminar style and one, two, three, three subjects taught in the lecture tutorial style. So, you know, we don't have that many lecture tutorial. Most of our classes are taught seminar styles. So seminar just means uh, one mm. teacher to about 40 students or 50 students. Uh, sometimes seminars can be as small as uh, 15 or 20. So it does depend on the classes. Negotiation and mediation uh, is very boutique. So we have just about 24 students, so you, it's very interactive. Uh, my entertainment law class where I put students in front like an Oprah Winfrey talk show style, mm. uh, that has 50 students. Yeah, so it, it varies. Okay. Okay, let me give you another ratio question. Mm, yes, yes. What's the ratio of local professors to foreign professors? I think that should go to the deep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Are you hiring enough locally? Is it all foreign talent? Mm. I think unique about NUS law that it's the, the, uh, of the serious law schools in the world, it's the only one I know of where not a single faculty member only has a degree from this jurisdiction. Every single faculty member has degrees from um, outside jurisdictions, many from multiple jurisdictions. In terms of the specific question, we're about 50%, uh, about slightly more than half Singapore citizens, slightly more than a quarter permanent residents, including myself, uh, and then slightly less than a quarter um, uh, non-citizens, non-permanent residents from all the major jurisdictions around the world. Uh, and that, what, what that means is that our faculty is uh, incredibly diverse and that adds to the sort of global community we cultivate here and the opportunities we create for our students. Mm, as you can tell, I've kind of um, run out of my <laughs> ability to, to, to draw uh, connections know, between so the, questions. the questions. So I'm kind of just going to go through them and um, okay. ask them as they come All up, right. right? So I'll ask something of women. Uh, how does it feel to study in a campus away from other NUS students? I heard from seniors that 
they sometimes feel quite isolated. And there's also a question from someone who graduated from Jurong Pioneer JC. I understand that there are many students in the law school who are from other top tier JCs. I wonder if I will fit in with the culture and cliques in law school. Friends are very important to me. So basically, I guess a question about the sort of the community, the culture, uh, the warmth uh, perhaps of uh, being here uh, on our BTC campus, which is otherwise very, very beautiful, as you can see from the campus tour photos and all that. Yeah. Uh, sure. So actually, maybe I'll start off by saying I'm, I'm a USP student actually, so I stay on campus. So for me, I'm fortunate enough to have you know both the fun at BTC as well as the fun on the Cambridge side of campus. Um, but really, I think at the end of the day, if you're looking to for the student life, there's a lot of things happening here at BTC as well. And part of that is what we do at Law Club. Uh, we do have a lot of sports uh, as well as arts interest groups if you're interested to join that. Uh, but of course, you're not just limited to the things at uh, Bukit Timah campus. If you do find that you know you want to do something that's university-wide, or you want to join a hall or an RC, you can do that as well. Um, there are other um, avenues and other sort of opportunities for you available back at the main campus as well. Um, what I will say about the warmth and the culture here is that um, I think there is a stereotype that law mm -hmm. students are snakes. Uh, it's a term that you know <laughs> a lot of the <laughs> A lot of the, the people in my generation I'm sort of use. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, and, and honestly, that was something that I, I was worried about when I, when I first came into law school. But in the one and a half years, I mean, close to two years now that I've been here, I really do find that you know, that's, that's really a myth. And that the people here are honestly really genuine and very, very warm. Um, they are willing to help you and they want to help you. So that's really nice. Um, if you're afraid of like, not knowing people in law school before you come in, uh, don't worry, we do have an orientation program. Um, and this orientation program is not like what you may have experienced in JC, it's not one week or two weeks. It actually lasts throughout the entire summer. We start with law camp, we have freshers week. Uh, there's a thing called REC, uh, Receive and Giving. It's basically something like a sort of massive dance performance between the faculties. So there are lots and lots of opportunities. I mean, even before school starts, for you to get to know people, to know your batchmates, and to know seniors as well. Um, and maybe I'll just plug in, uh, sell a bit of uh, a here and advertisement. But if you are interested in finding out more about orientation, you can also follow us on our Instagram, at NUSLawOrientation. Uh, and we'll be releasing lots of information about what we're doing during orientation and Basically, you can meet some of the seniors as well. And uh, I should put in a plug for women and her, um, her law club uh, uh, committee. Uh, I think they do a wonderful, wonderful job of um, organizing events, um, ways for, for students to get to know each other. Welfare is very high, I, I know, also um, uh, in their minds. And it really makes my life as vice dean of student life so much easier uh, when I'm working with um, uh, students like women and, and her team uh, to ensure the well-being um, uh, and helpfulness of, of students on campus and uh, uh, I hope that uh, you can you can tell that also I like to think um, at law school um, the the relationship between students and faculty uh, is, is a warm one uh, we're a very small faculty so we, we believe in knowing our students well um, and in um, being, I think, um, friends as, as well as uh, their teachers uh, and their mentors. So, um, well, she has to say yes because she's sitting next to me. But uh, again, later on, you can go ask her honest opinion. Uh, um, yes. Um, going down the list um, and um, still keeping you on the hot seat, uh, hot seat uh, women, but maybe David will want to support you. <laughs> yourself. Yes, yes, seat. yeah. <laughs> what are law exams like? Oh, wow. mm. Okay, so there are quite a few different sort of modes of assessment. Um, something you might have heard about is this thing called class participation, class part. Uh, so that is one mode of assessment. Um, but I do believe that actually, I think it's a university policy that um, for all the modules, you can't just have one mode of assessment. So it can't be, most of the time at least, it can't be a 100% exam. So it has to be, I think, at least some portion of it has to be some other component. So that could be class part or a take home assignment, something like that. Um, but for most of our exams, at least in year one and year two, it is a, you know, a, a sit-down um, examination. Uh, most of the time, it's open book, um, but closed computer. 
So for exams in law school, we don't write anymore. Or, okay, you could write if you want to, but most of us type. Uh, so it's done on the computer, uh, and then you have your notes with you, and um, you can refer to them basically to, uh, on top you answer the question. Um, and essentially, I think the point is that law isn't really, and I guess this links back to the earlier question about memory work, law isn't really so much about memorizing as much as really understanding the concepts and knowing when and how to apply uh, these concepts. So that also reflects in the way we sort of assess our students um, at NUS. Yeah, yeah and, and I think by the time you get to third and fourth year, there's a lot more flexibility. So you have these yeah. six-hour take-home exams, mm. or you could have a whole semester to do a, a, a research paper. Yeah. The students, these real claims mm. filed in New York and California, and I said, you know, pretend you are the junior associate in the law firm, your partner comes 9 a.m. in the morning, that, that's when you download your take-home exam, and then say, the partner needs in six hours' times at 3 p.m. for you to submit a short memo. <laughs> right? So you, you do it from home, you have the whole internet and you can write or you can eat, you can write and eat, and then you submit in six hours' time, and then that's like worth 80% mm -hmm. of, of the total grade and 20% is your class participation. So, so we're very flexible here. And is it true that there will be pass-fail modules to help with the stress factor in law school? Uh, we don't have pass-fail modules, but one new innovation is we, we do this grade forgiveness. Uh, so... The class of honours we award when you finally graduate is based on a cumulative numerical average that's weighted. Uh, so the, the algorithm would simply take out 12 credits. You do a total of uh, 160 credits. We take out equivalent to about three subjects of your lowest grades, and that's not included in your computation. Okay. Yeah, so you, you don't get overtly stressed that in the first year I need to do really well or I got one C, that's the end of me getting a first class honours. Uh, the computer would just... <laughs> you don't take that out of the way. Okay, well that might be, um, that might be reassuring to another um, uh, uh, questioner here who says, Hi, excited to join NUS Law, but do you have any advice for the guys who have just come out of NS? We've heard a lot about the rigour of the course and the time uh, there NS has been dot 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 decaying. Aha. Any <laughs> tips or tricks to come up to speed or are we just worrying uh, okay. too much? <laughs> so I think of all of us here, I'm the only one who had done NS. <laughs> and Jean had it. Uh, so, <laughs> so I finished NS and I was just dying to study. So I got a first it's class on this. Wow. <laughs> You'll be quite excited to use your brain in a different way again once you get into universities. So in fact, uh, you're just like a sponge, you know, <laughs> mm. uh, try, trying to soak in all the knowledge. So I, I think it doesn't make your brain decay. In fact, it makes your brain sharper. Mm. Okay, that's at least my take. Okay, all right. You should talk to the D other David students. David is exceptional in every way, and we no, all no, know that. No. We all know that. Um, still sort of talking about law school, what it's like and all that. How important is it to be an all-rounded individual in, in law school? And I think there was another question uh, about uh, do, we, do we have to take... Um, uh, uh, extracurricular activities? Um, will we be able to choose our tutorial classes such that we may have time for CCAs, etc., etc.? I guess people are worried again about this whole work life um, balance thing. And, um, we should ask her first. Then we should ask <laughs> women first. Yeah, she got a lot of CCAs. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Miss <laughs> Super Superwoman. Um, how how does one be you? <laughs> mm. So actually, something I didn't know before I joined law school, and I'm very thankful for after I joined, was that actually there really is a lot of free time in your timetable, uh, in between classes, and, and of course in the evening or even in the morning sometimes. Uh, so if you're interested in doing, you know, extracurricular, it is always you definitely have the time to do it. Um, it's really about how you manage your time, how you handle your readings and balance um, that with the extracurricular that you're interested in. Um, do you have to do extracurricular? I don't think so. It's, it's definitely not a requirement to graduate or anything. I, I, I don't think so, right? Yeah, it's not a requirement to graduate. <laughs> but, but yeah, so it really depends on what you want to get out of your university experience. Uh, mm -hmm. And for me, before I joined uni, I really knew that 
Um, I mean, yes, I wanted to learn the law, but I wanted to learn more than the law. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that I developed myself holistically as well. So that was something that I did try to do at least my first one and a half years here. Uh, and hopefully I continue to do that in the next, um, the next couple of years as well. Um, there are a lot of opportunities, uh, as I mentioned, here at BTC, um, as well as in the main campus. So if you're interested, that the sky's the limit, I think, in university. And it's really up to you to reinvent yourself if you want to, to discover your passions and, and really just uh, make sure you make the most use of your time here. Mm. Um, did you want to say something? Yeah, 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 just to echo what, uh, what women are saying, um, and I think the purpose of a university degree, any university degree, whatever you study, is precisely it's that opportunity to really find, invent yourself in a way that it's not always possible at secondary school, junior college, NS and so on. Uh, and so we really do encourage, we create opportunities, we don't force people to do extracurricular activities. But it's striking that some of the students who do exceptionally well uh, in law school also have rich lives outside of law school. Um, every year, the graduating cohort completely script, score, and choreograph a musical, which is an extraordinary performance that, uh, that they put on every year. Uh, and indeed, this isn't just about self-actualization. It's actually relevant to your careers. Because when you go out into the workforce, um, people don't just want lawyers. Law firms don't just want people who can answer questions. They want wholly rounded individuals who can have relationships with clients, be interesting to work with. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why, as uh, women rightly notes, that the schedule is pretty confined. So you have a lot of free time to do what you want. Uh, and we hope you uh, use that time wisely, as people like women have. I, I want to still want, continue on that note. No, I, but I, I think I still have something to add. I, know, I, I oh, did have a question. I didn't have a question. Oh. I, I've just been sort of brought up okay. short by, by someone who mm. has uh, uh, is coming in from overseas okay. and um, has requested that we define or break down what some of our abbreviations are. And obviously, oh. even Simon has been in Singapore long enough that he started to use um, abbreviations and acronyms in the way that uh, we, are, we are so bad about doing here in uh, Singapore. So my apologies to our overseas um, uh, uh, participants and uh, we will try to do our best uh, not to use those acronyms or at least or to like explain CCA, what we mean. CCA. Yeah, for, so for example, uh, CCA is uh, co-curricular um, activities. I think we've been talking about NS, which is our naval, national service or army. And earlier on, we talked about uh, polys, which are our polytechnics and our junior colleges, which are our JC. So, um, you know, stop me if I'm, I'm going on without uh, explaining and I will stop you if you're going on without explaining. But back to you to, to continue, David. No, I've completely yeah, forgot what I was going to say. To do that. <laughs> that was you my always evil, do that to me. nefarious okay, theme, uh, David. Yes, yes, yes. The core cur curricular activity, mm. so CCAs. Uh, I, I think this, this reminds me of the law chat. So I, I'm plugging my law chat. <laughs> uh, so, so Jerry, who's one of the guys who did law chat, um, he, he takes on the criminal justice pro bono work as his sort of outside studies uh, activities. And we have Min Tong, who who's took on jazz, you know, music as her outside law studies activities. Others do mooting. So you, you can do something that's more related to your law studies, but mm -hmm. you can call it outside law study activity that gets you excited. Or you can do something like swimming. Uh, I know someone who, mm. who represented school before and now he's swimming for NUS. Uh, or you can do music. So you can do sports, music, something creative. Uh, it's, it's entirely up to you. So there's certainly mm. a lot of time <laughs> for you to engage in non-law stuff. Um, and I suppose uh, on, on that uh, topic of flexibility, I'm, I'm really trying my segue skills here. On, on, the, on the topic of flexibility, I noticed there were quite a few questions that perhaps we, we didn't um, address directly, although I know that we talked around it, um, to do with the so-called saturation um, in the market for lawyers. And we've been making a point about quite how flexible life in law school is, uh, quite how flexible the many paths are that we might have as a, uh, as a lawyer after law school. But uh, I think some of the um, participants here want us to directly answer the question whether uh, you know the pathway in law is going to lead to a oversaturated market and I thought maybe um, Simon you've been quieter for a while you want to take that one I pass you all the tough big picture questions as you can oh, tell right? question, mm. so uh, Minister Shanmugam also one of our alumni 
um, talked about a glut of law students and lawyers uh, about four years ago. Um, that really wasn't directed at NUS or indeed SMU. Uh, and indeed at the same time, we were setting up a third law school at SUSS. What it was directed at was the irrational exuberance of parents and students going off to England, not people who were turning us down or indeed turning SMU down, but going off to England, paying 100,000 pounds to get a law degree and then coming back and not being able to get a training contract. Uh, the vast majority, 95 or so percent of our students are uh, employed as lawyers um, a year after graduating. Uh, and um, their salaries are available through the Graduate Employment Survey. Uh, so um, in terms of the immediate um, prospects, they're still extremely good. Uh, it's true we don't have 100% employment, but 95% employment is quite extraordinary anywhere around the world. But that's not really the lens through which I would view this. Really, I think you should regard a university degree not as just a passport to getting one year out. Uh, so our job is not to give students the abilities to practice as a lawyer for the year after they graduate. What we want to give people is critical analytical communication skills that will be useful wherever they go decades into the future. Uh, and so what I would suggest is that people thinking about law in terms of employment look not just at the immediate short-term employment prospects, but also what opportunities there are further on into the future. So a long-ish way of saying, no, I don't think there's a, there's a glut of students. The reality is now the number of Singaporeans going off to England has dropped. Uh, and so there are slightly fewer uh, students coming back from England, Singaporeans coming back from England with law degrees. Uh, but maybe one just illustration of uh, my point is that in all our discussions with the government, there was never a serious suggestion that we should be cutting down the number of law students that we admit at NUS, which has remained constant for about the last 15 years. On the point of England, there was a question um, I'm, you know, here, I think, about uh, from someone who is uh, trying to decide between studying law uh, in England or um, here in Singapore. And I um, guess the question is what might be some of the considerations that person should bear in mind as they're making that decision? A couple of comments. One is um, there are some schools that have radically different education models. If you get into Oxford or Cambridge, you can afford it. I'm not going to say hand on heart we're a better law school than Oxford or Cambridge. Some of my colleagues would disagree. Um, but if you think you're going to practice in London, by all means, go off to London to study law. If you think you're going to start practice in Singapore, um, then one of the things that we offer is not just an education tied to Singapore and tied to Asia, uh, but also a network. Uh, our alumni network is, uh, is very important in terms of um, a cohort of people who go through law school, go into practice. Uh, those professional connections that you make along the way are incredibly important. Uh, and so uh, anyone who's thinking about going abroad just to, to get away from Singapore, um, I wouldn't do it um, because you think that that's going to necessarily benefit you. Uh, and indeed, um, if your main interest is having an opportunity to go abroad, then I'd refer you back to our exchange opportunities or indeed the Exchange Plus that we men's going on, uh, that, uh, that fully half of our students do go off uh, for a semester or two. Uh, the last thing I'll say on this topic is that um, I did get um, some feedback from uh, the father of a, a woman who was tying up between going to NUS or King's College London mm. uh, and um, eventually chose to come to NUS. Uh, and the father wrote me this very nice email saying she was loving it at NUS and I had saved him a hundred thousand pounds. Um, <laughs> so that's one other consideration. Although I should emphasize that doesn't mean we shortchange our students. The, the fact that it's much cheaper here is because most of our revenue, most of our uh, the money that pays for the education comes from tax dollars, which we get whether you study here or not. So don't think just because a, a foreign university costs more that it's better uh, because the investment is broadly comparable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, 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 no plugs for no, me. I, I've, I've got I'm sure there are more questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to take a, a, a little bit of break. We've been talking um, a lot about um, the undergraduate uh, program, and uh, I, I, I know that that's probably the, the greatest um, uh, 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 audience out there. But um, I'm seeing that I actually have um, a, a few uh, uh, participants here uh, who are actually potential uh, master's students. And I wondered, David, if you wanted to just speak very quickly to them. I mean, there's a, there's a question here about whether it's possible to earn a master's degree from NUS without any external financial help from 
parents. Um, I think there were a couple of other uh, questions here from uh, LLM students about what we offer, but perhaps um, mm. uh, if, if you could just address that very quickly. And again, I apologize to those of you out there um, who are primarily interested in our LLM program that uh, we're spending so much time talking a little bit more about the undergraduate program today, but we do have a, a separate uh, website. We've got some webinars about our LLM program that you can also access. And of course, um, any specific questions about admissions, please do just uh, write in to us uh, through the various links that are there. and We'll try to get back to you on a much more personal basis. But um, for today's session, I'm just going to pass it over to David to, to address the LLM market uh, yeah, generally. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, our LLM is the Masters of Law, and it's, it's Latin, so LLM is the acronym. Uh, we have a number of specializations, so if you already have a law degree, you need to have a law degree in order to do the LLM here. If you already have a law degree, then you can decide whether you want to specialize in a particular area. So on our website, we list the different specializations like uh, international arbitration and dispute resolution, intellectual property and technology law, Asian legal studies, maritime law, and, and a couple of others. Uh, if you don't want to specialize, we have a general LLM with no specialization. We also have a boutique one with uh, Shanghai in the ECUPL, where you can do one semester at NUS and then one semester in Shanghai, and then NUS awards you the LLM degree. So more information on our website, uh, the different LLMs. Uh, so do, do take a look. Our brochure is very comprehensive. And I, I would say our LLM, mm. we attract students from different parts of the world. So a majority do come from Asia. Uh, I had the privilege of teaching two Swiss students. Mm. Uh, they were a couple, they got married. Then they said, we want to do an LLM, but we don't want to go to the US because everyone from Europe goes to the US. So they typed in best law school in Asia, and hey, and US popped up. Uh, so they ended up oh, here. Oh, advertising <laughs> and, money going to and, good effect. And, and this wonderful Swiss couple, uh, they still keep in touch with me, and they send me Swiss chocolates every year. And, and they really enjoy the, the whole Asian experience, that we are quite Western in the way you know, Singapore is structured, it is, it's efficient. But at the same time, they, they look at sort of an Asian global view, that's, that's why we're called Asia's Global Law School, sort of the Asian global view of the world. Uh, mm. So certainly I think our LLM does appeal to people from so. different continents. And I found the other question here. So this, this uh, Dewey here uh, describes um, uh, themselves as a prospective LLM student from New Zealand mm. and asks, what is the student culture like? For instance, student associations, what kind of events are held? clubs, uh, specialized centers such as EPSEL? Is there a separate association for uh, the uh, master's students? Um, and I, I think what we can say here is that uh, we, have, we do indeed have quite a diverse uh, master's student population. We don't exactly, I think, have a separate club for mm -hmm. them, but um, each year um, our, you know, there'll be uh, several representatives of the year's cohort uh, who form a little bit of committee uh, for their cohort and help to organize social and other events. Also, um, the undergraduates, when they, uh, uh, when they organize events, always welcome um, our master's students uh, to join them. And all our various uh, centers and student clubs uh, are open uh, to our master's students, although I'll be entirely honest and say, you know, some of the undergraduate student um, clubs perhaps uh, uh, don't appeal that much to uh, our master's students who might be at a different point uh, in, in their lives. Uh, but I think there is a sort of a separate uh, a social community uh, among our, our master's students that we, we try to support and to encourage. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in to say that our different research centers, they, they mm. tend to have many lunchtime seminars. So all the students are invited. Undergraduate students tend like they don't care. <laughs> uh, we, we get more of the PhD students and the LLM students who attend these lunchtime seminars. So we have a center for law and business, the technology law one, Asian mm. legal studies, environmental law. So the LLM community, they do come. Mm -hmm. um, and they also tend to cluster as groups within their specializations. Mm -hmm. So if they yeah. do a corporate and financial services law LLM, let's say we have about 30 students 
in a particular cohort and a specialization. They mm. tend to want to stick together mm. because they network, they're in the same industry. So it's more in, informal community groups that gather rather than formalized clubs. Mm. Yeah, and and on the question on the question of oh, did you want to say something oh, okay, about no, how no. how uh, okay? Um, we we do have do we have like a soccer match where the where the graduates um, play the the undergraduates and almost won this year was there something like that? I think it was faculty faculty and yeah, was students the faculty. And, and the faculty <laughs> I think the faculty yeah. won almost won. <laughs> So that yeah, was, yeah. That was that's because that's <laughs> Simon was, was our striker, of course, and none of the undergraduates dared to tackle him, I think. That, that's really what it was all about. Yeah. Um, uh, talking about sort of clusters uh, um, of uh, uh, subjects and all, uh, there seem to be several questions from uh, uh, candidates who were interested in sort of international law as, mm. as a as a cluster, and um, I know that we've talked about the LLM being sort of different specializations, yeah. but something we haven't made, we haven't talked so much about is how even within the undergraduate mm, uh, sort mm. of uh, so. uh, elective um, electives, there there are clusters, and you can kind of specialize. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, when you get the third and yeah. final year. So I, I I brought this because you can download this online, and inside you can see. And you can't see it now, but we do put all our electives into different clusters. So it's easier for you to choose when you're in third and fourth year, mm. you know, what subjects you, you might want to do. Uh, we have the Centre for International Law, that's a university centre. And again, there are many visiting professors, researchers who give lunchtime talks, which you can attend. But when what you can actually study, uh, we have Law of the Sea, we have Climate Change, we have international humanitarian law, we have international refugee law, and uh, just practically everything that's a part of international law it, it is in here. Uh, so every semester you have at least 12 international comparative law subjects to choose from. Yeah, so we, we do have quite a strong focus on international law here. And of course, our dean. Uh, Professor Chesterman is an international law expert, and he's he's already sort of you know <laughs> leaning forward because he wants to uh, step in and and talk about international law. I'm sure. So when I was appointed dean, I was the first non-Singaporean dean essentially since colonial times. Is it really appropriate for the National Law School not to have a Singaporean dean? And um, my answer to that is the same one I'd give you today, which is that of course we're the National Law School, but we have a global role, uh, and more than half of Singapore's economic activity is cross-border. Uh, Singapore is one of the most open countries in the world economically. And so I think it's vital that all law graduates of Singapore, of NUS, and indeed any Singaporean lawyer, be outward looking. Uh, and so that's why it's so important that we provide these opportunities that David was talking about in terms of the electives. Uh, but also what we've tried to do really with the curriculum is ensure that our, our graduates are really positioned to take advantage of Asia. So that's why we have a compulsory subject, which is legal systems of Asia, why we require students to take one from a basket of civil law country um, modules, so that our students really are sort of engaging with the world. Uh, so much as it's my own area of interest, I think it's also in everyone's interest at least to do a little bit of international law so that they can take advantage of those opportunities. Um, there is an odd question. It is about international law, so I might as well <laughs> ask it. Uh, it describes itself as an odd question. It's not like I'm, I'm, I'm characterizing anything. With regards to international law, I'm wondering if I were to study in NUS law, would I be studying a neutral take on the topic? This stems from a photograph I saw within an NUS law video featuring U.S military personnel during an overseas exchange program. I'm afraid that was my fault. That was the little study trip that we, we, we did in actually in the former Yugoslavia. But since the US, for instance, does not ratify UNCLOS in maritime law, does such a factor affect the topics I might study at NUS law? Just slightly curious about this. I think the question is whether we're pro-US and, and sort of biased <laughs> and how we're going to teach uh, uh, our subjects, Simon. That's a wonderful, very, very niche question. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer it with, with two examples. Uh, one on Law of the Sea specifically. Uh, we have uh, some of the leading scholars on Law of the Sea, like Bob Beckman, uh, emerging scholars like Tara Davenport. We've become one of the focal points for research on the South China Sea partly because Singapore precisely has no interest. Singapore has no claim in the South China Sea. 
Uh, and so Singapore, in that sense, we position ourselves really as, a, uh, as an impartial um, forum uh, that, that can bring legal minds, can create opportunities for our students. Uh, and so in that sense, I think we've managed to negotiate a pretty, pretty effective role. Uh, we've also been the site of academic conferences and teaching on potentially quite controversial topics ranging from the death penalty to uh, the Occupy, uh, Occupy movement in, um, in, Washington, in Wall Street and then around the world, the more recent um, disturbances in Hong Kong. Uh, and I think um, if there's one thing we're trying to cultivate, it's certainly not a partisan view of one position or another. What we want to do is really create opportunities for our students and our academics to pursue the truth wherever it might lead them. Um, so no, I don't think we're certainly not pushing any particular agenda. Uh, and in our own classes, I mean, you can speak to this yourself, Al, I suspect. Uh, in my class, if I think there's someone who's coming with an agenda, then almost immediately my impulse is to try and poke some holes in it, to, to make them question their assumptions uh, and be a little bit more open-minded. Right, and then if, if we didn't do that, women would, women and, and her uh, colleagues would, uh, would force us to do that anyway and, and, and challenge our views, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I think that um, at NUS Law, uh, we, we um, well, I think we have strong opinions. Mm -hmm. I think that would be fair. Mm -hmm. But as you've already seen from uh, this evening, while we sometimes agree with, with each other, we don't always, and we're more than happy yeah. to jump in no, and, we, we, and we dispute each other. No, we teach students to, to have opinions, and, and I teach freedom of speech, and some people are like, what? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, is there free speech? Uh, no, but what, what I take the students through is a process of thinking. I, I teach them the, the US free speech culture. You, you go through the cases, and then you look at Europe, you look at Australia, then you look at Singapore. Why pick these? Because I said, if we are first world democracies, you know, Singapore's first world, and then we have certain you know, standard of living, why are we so different in terms of free speech culture? You know, is there such a thing as universal free speech? So students get to think for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, and to what extent, say, do they accept hate speech in Singapore when it's protected by the First Amendment in the US? So sometimes we say we must be more like the US, but can we pick and choose what we like from the US in free speech, or is free speech sort of everything as, as a parcel? So we get students to have an opinion on these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's right. Um, we're, we're kind of getting close to um, uh, our, our last few minutes together, and I, I do note that there may be a few highly rated questions that we might have addressed sort of in, in, in passing, but uh, let me do this. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to read out a few of them, mm. and then I'm going to go around and let all the panelists sort of have one last say, and whatever you feel like, uh, answering and you can take notes looking expectantly <laughs> at the at the paper you can take Big notes, notes. And, and whatever you which ones of these you feel like taking you you can do and and then we'll we'll close right um, so uh, right at the top um, which I think Simon did deal with but I think they want a more explicit answer is what is the acceptance rate for NUS law all right um, we've talked about career paths. Like, here's a specific question that maybe we didn't deal with directly. How is the pathway to becoming a lawyer in Singapore like from graduation to the bar exam to TCs and so on? Actually, this person from the frame of the question probably already knows what the pathway mm. is, but maybe someone can answer this. Um, one question here, um, does putting law as your second choice decrease the competitiveness of your application? Uh, another specific question, what are the chances of obtaining a scholarship from NUS to study law in the school? Uh, specific question, I think an answer very quickly. Can, can we be able to practice law when you do a double degree program? Yes, mm. yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, ah, how are aptitude-based applicants evaluated relative to the rest of the applicants? Do less than stellar grades disadvantage them in any way? Or will leadership and community service, etc., play a larger role um, in determining whether they can be accepted to NUS law? Um, okay. Uh, based on the previous cohorts, what are the chances of getting the law course when we have a B in GP and the rest is oh. A? Uh, and linked to that, I suppose, do you have a cutoff point for IB graduates? 
Yeah, IB. IB. Uh, it, international Baccalaureate. <laughs> um, since NUS Law only sends one offer, if law is my first choice, what happens if I get an interview and don't get in? Um, actually, the short answer to that is you'll be considered for your next choice. I've answered that already. Does being a Singapore PR lower my choices of getting into law school? No. Um, Ah, I think there's a question about double degree programs. How will the time be split between the two fields and will students have to travel between the two campuses? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay. Um, how much are junior lawyers paid? How many hours in a day do they have to work? I have heard that they have to work till after midnight is true. Please advise. Thanks. All right. Um, okay. Um, correct. Mm. Um, yeah, there are a few questions about PRs. Being a PR doesn't hurt your, your choices at uh, uh, your chances at all. Uh, question uh, here. I want to pursue commercial rather than disputes law. Should I still come to NUS or should SMU be the better choice for me? No, no, NUS. No, NUS. NUS, Oi. NUS. Okay. Um, what are some challenges you have faced in your law career? And I think there was someone who asked, if um, uh, if they wanted to be uh, if they wanted to be in academia like us, um, you know, uh, uh, what should they do? <laughs> because we are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> David, David, David. Let me once okay, again. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm going to answer this one, and then I'm I'm going to throw it out to the to, to y'all. If I'm not shortlisted for the written assessment and interview, would my chance to be shortlisted? be zero if I were to apply again in the following AY. Um, if I'm shortlisted but not offered this AY, would the result be taken into account if I were to apply again the following AY? Second question, no, it will be as if it was a fresh um, application. First question, I suppose um, uh, it's not an absolute uh, zero chance because um, year to year uh, there, there could be slight changes in, in uh, uh, the point at which we, we cut off to, to interview, but um, uh, chances would probably not be strong. Okay. All right. So did you all speed round? Did you all take down the questions that you might be prepared to Most answer? Most for you. <laughs> well, they, I mean, you don't have to answer. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, I'm yeah. giving you a last yeah, yeah. chance to answer. You pick and choose. You okay. make your final closing right. arguments, so to speak. And uh, I let you go first, David, because you're always okay, okay. so I, fresh. Yes, I'm ready to go see lots of notes. Very good. <laughs> okay. So I, I'll take the one about the double degree program because we have quite a few. Uh, so you should think carefully whether or not you want to do a double degree program or do law with a minor. We have about 50 to 60 different minors uh, across all the different faculties. And, and that's something that doesn't tie you down to five years. You can do it within the four year of a law degree. Traveling between campuses, we try to minimize the travel. That's why we have these structured double degree programs. So for economics, life sciences, and business administration, your first three years, you are at law. And your final two years, uh, you would be at the other faculty. So you do most of your compulsory subjects and a few electives, uh, all at law. And then you do your, say, first year econ, second year econs, if you're doing economics over at the faculty in arts and social sciences. Mm -hmm. If you chose a minor, um, then there might be some traveling. We have the internal shuttle bus that departs every 30 minutes. And an <laughs> app that tells you when it's coming. Yeah, yeah. so, so it is, it's not Which so strong. Which you can't rely on. We've <laughs> been, we've been. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. uh. um, the, the other difference is the Yale Liberal Arts and Law double degree oh. program. So your first year, you are at Yale, and then not Yale in the US, but Yale over at Cambridge. And then your next three years, you are at law, and your final year, you go back to, to Yale to finish up. So, so these are the different structured DDPs. Thank That's you, David. It. That's yes. it. Nice and sharp. Choose wisely, choose us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need one or two final words addressing some of the final questions. Yeah, had. sure. Um, we are the start of the, the academic grades question. I think generally there's an assumption that uh, most law students are straight A students. And I will be the first to admit that I am not a straight A student, actually. 
Um, and in fact, I did get a, a C grade for one of my subjects, but we're still here, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so... Adversity, having <laughs> overcome it, right? But yeah, so, so grades are just one of the, only one of the factors um, that you consider here. Um, but I think in determining whether or not you want to come to NUS at the end of the day, uh, yes, it will be hard work. If you, uh, with regards to the question about working hours, I think it's hard work in law school and it's hard work once you graduate. So uh, if that's something that turns you off, then maybe law might not be for you. But if you're willing to put in the hard work, you're willing to grind, then sure. Um, and maybe I'll just touch a little bit on the SMU versus NUS question just to answer that, because I think someone wasn't here earlier. Um, but for me, I was deciding between both schools as well. Um, before I uh, joined the NUS. Uh, and a few things that um, stood out to me or were relevant factors that I considered was firstly um, that I wanted a multidisciplinary experience. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I wanted to learn about the law, but also outside the law. Um, I came from a science background, so being able to still learn a bit about science um, was important to me. So that's also why I'm part of the University Scholars Program, USP. Uh, and that's where I get to learn a bit more about things outside the law as well. Uh, the second thing is really about student life. Um, the good thing about NUS is that we do have a campus, so if you're interested in campus living or, or being able to you know, stay up really late and uh, take part in CCAs till you know, a few a.m. in the morning, you can do that. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's another factor that I considered. Uh, and lastly, I think really at the end of the day, it's really what you want to do with, with your university experience. Uh, it really is the last four years before you sort of start work and I suppose uh, have to slave a little bit. Um, but yeah, um, really, Think about what you want to do um, with your time here. It is really quite precious. Um, think about what opportunities will be able to help you develop yourself and um, to make the most of your time. And uh, the penultimate word to Simon, because I have the last. Three points addressing some of the questions. Um, starting with finances, there was a question about scholarships, and I'll link that with, with mm -hmm. bursaries. So scholarships apply, no harm applying. You might have to write an extra essay, but no harm applying. But bursaries are very important to the law school because we really do want to make sure that no one's denied a legal education for financial reasons. So if you're worried about the cost of law school, uh, certainly for Singapore and undergraduates applying, there is, there is a, a lot of support. About 10% of our students do get financial aid. So there's no shame in, uh, in putting your hand up to get a helping hand uh, in that area. Second, on, uh, on admissions and the acceptance rate and the aptitude tests, um, so once you get into the interview, so getting into the interview is not easy. I talked earlier about how there's an academic cutoff or the discretionary admissions. Once you're in that interview, it's all on you, the interview and written test. At that point, we really don't care about what you got in terms of grades. We know they were good enough to get you in the room. Uh, and so you're at no disadvantage. And once you're in those interviews, the acceptance rate is around one quarter. So we interview around four times the number of students that, that we can bring in. Uh, and then thirdly, I can't resist also taking the SMU bait. Uh, anyone who at age 18 thinks that they're just going to practice corporate law for the rest of their lives, uh, I would encourage you to think more broadly about the possibilities that your life might have. Uh, and in terms of the choice, like we men were saying, I think by all means apply to SMU as well as NUS. Um, but you should only take SMU if two conditions are satisfied. First, that you're certain you will only ever practice corporate law. Uh, and second, if you didn't get an offer from us. <laughs> um, but, um, but I don't want to go on any further because clearly David and Elle have warring TV shows that they're <laughs> trying to pitch to uh, networks. David's, uh, you might have heard David has some videos online you can watch as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put in a plug for We Min's also, but really thank you well, thanks Wei Min and We Min and thank you David for, for a really rich discussion and thanks to uh, the people who have still stayed on with us past mm -hmm. the scheduled closing time. But final word is Elle's. And uh, well that pretty much brings us to the end of this live session. Um, I was just going to say, um, hang around a little longer. We'll be putting up a couple of slides uh, after we sign off. Uh, one of them will give you um, a link to be able to, as I promised, um, get the behind the scenes, um, real life, true uh, 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 story from uh, students uh, that you can connect with and our seniors will uh, here will we'll, we'll tell you the real deal. Uh, the other uh, will give you a uh, the other slide will give you a link uh, to our administrative team uh, who will be happy to answer some of the um, sort of more nitty gritty uh, questions that uh, you might have. Um, and of course, indeed, if you hang around on the website, click on some of the other videos, all of which feature David. Um, <laughs> or, <laughs> 
uh, yes. Or, or indeed, uh, uh, if you return here in a couple of days, um, uh, I, I believe we'll be we'll be um, putting up this uh, uh, webinar uh, all over again, and you can relive some of our worst moments. But um, but quite seriously, um, uh, this despite uh, some of the the levity and I uh, that you may have um, uh, uh, witnessed uh, this evening, we do know. Uh, that you have quite an important and difficult decision to make. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, none of us um, would poke fun at it. Uh, the, the, the questions um, were all uh, very important. We hope that uh, our answers, um, and maybe more importantly, you know, who we are and how we have shared ourselves with you, um, will help you to make this uh, difficult and important decision in a way that uh, works best for you, because I think um, that's what w we would all want. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then I think this has been time, I hope, well spent for all of us. Uh, we are signing off for now, but we hope that we'll see some of you uh, in person in this campus um, in the not too distant future. So good night. Thank you.